We do want to wish you a, a Merry Christmas this morning. And for those of you who are visiting with us, those of you who are watching online maybe for the first time, we're truly honored that you chose to come and worship and celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus on this very special day. And so we welcome you. We're wrapping up a series that we've been calling, He Shall Be Called. And so for the past three weeks, we've been looking at prophetic names given to Jesus some 700 years before his birth as recorded in the book of Isaiah. And I want to read to you from Isaiah 9.6. It says, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so for the past three weeks, we've been looking at each of these titles, and we talked about the wonderful counselor. Then two weeks ago, we talked about the mighty God. Last week, my wife shared with you her take on the everlasting Father, and today we're going to discuss the Prince of Peace, and I always want to tell you that it's the perfect, perfect topic for our Christmas message. Some of you love Christmas. Like you're excited about Christmas. You like to shop. You like to decorate. You like to bake. All the things that go along with Christmas, you're all about. You get down with your Christmassy little self. Come on, where are you at? Where my people just love Christmas? Now, this can be hard for you to understand, but not everybody feels that way. For you, it's truly the most wonderful time of the year, but for others, it can be the most challenging. The words peace and Christmas just don't seem to go together. Because other people don't like shopping. And they had to shop, and that was difficult. And, and then they're wondering, how am I going to pay for this when the bills come in in January? And are the kids even going to appreciate it anyway? And then there's the house that needs to be decorated, and trees put up, and lights put out outside, and cards mailed out, and then Christmas parties. Come on, somebody. Christmas parties for the extroverts. Man, you guys love them. You can't get enough of Christmas parties. But for some people, the introverts, if they never went to another Christmas party in their life, that would be just fine by them. Somebody just winked at me. <laughs> then there's the wrapping, the baking, the meal prep, preparing the house for guests. Or it's off to grandmother's house you go, so you got to travel. But either way, you're going to be coming together with family and some of those family members you haven't seen since last Christmas, and that's not on accident, and it's not necessarily because they live far away. It's because you really haven't wanted to see them since last Christmas because you know you're getting ready to walk into a very merry Jerry Springer Christmas. <laughs> and so for those of you who feel that way, it could be anything but the most wonderful time of the year, and it could be anything but peaceful. But I'm here to tell you this morning, regardless of how you feel about the holiday season, you can have peace through Jesus this Christmas. Would you pray with me? Father, let this Christmas not be about gifts and food or even family. God, we want to enjoy all those things for the glory of God. But Christmas is about Jesus. And God, it's our desire to honor and glorify him this Christmas and throughout the new year. And so, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather and celebrate together this day. And it's in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to look at Luke chapter 2. We're going to look at a very familiar passage and part of the Christmas story. And instead of reading it all, I'm going to kind of summarize the beginning and then we'll get to it. And so the chapter starts in Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor of his day, he ordered a census. And so Joseph was from, his ancestors at least, were from the city of Bethlehem, called the city of David. And so he had to go and register them. And if you know the story, he and Mary were on the way and, and it comes time for her to deliver the baby, referring to Jesus. Except there's no room in the inn, so they end up going to basically what's nothing more than a barn and delivering the baby and Jesus is put in a manger. And that's where we pick it up in verse 8. It says, in that same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with a, the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. And so the angel confirmed what Isaiah had said 700 years earlier, that Jesus would bring peace on earth. And I want to share with you this morning three things I know about peace. And the first is this, peace is a person. Peace is a person. Paul said in Ephesians 2.14, Jesus is our peace. But when we look at the condition of our world, can we agree it's anything but peaceful today? There are nations on the verge of war, pestilence, disease, terrorism, genocide, human trafficking. Am I lifting up anybody's spirit this Christmas? But it is our reality. And for the last couple decades, we've seen the divorce rate skyrocket. We we've, have some studies that would indicate that worldwide poverty is at an all-time high. And then we get into political turmoil. Look, I don't care which aisle you stand on politically. I think we can all agree that Washington is not a peaceful place right now, right? And so if Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he came to bring goodwill to men and peace on earth, we have to ask a question if that's not what we see. And the question is this, did he fail? Well, that depends on how you define peace. See, we tend to define peace as absence of conflict. Right? So when the kids are getting along and, and things with the spouse are okay and the boss is in a good mood, we call that peace. But can I tell you, you can have conflict in your life and still be at peace. Peace with God is possible even when peace on earth is not. And the reason is because peace is not the absence of something, but the presence of someone. And that's Jesus. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. In Hebrew, it's Sar Shalom. The word Tsar comes from the Roman word or the Greek word Tsar, which eventually became Caesar. And we talked about Caesar Augustus already. You've heard of Julius Caesar. That these, these were names given or titles given to Roman emperors. And so when we talked about the Caesars, they were the ones in charge. They were the ones that ruled the kingdom. And so basically, Jesus is the Caesar or he's the one that rules the kingdom of Shalom or the kingdom of peace. But what does shalom mean? It means more than just a peaceful, easy feeling, so to speak. Shalom means completeness. It means wellness. It speaks about human friendship. The Jews still greet each other with the term shalom. But most of the times, the 25 times that Isaiah used the word peace, it's about covenantal relationship and friendship with God. That's ultimately what peace means. And only Jesus can reconcile us to the Father. The Bible is clear. There is no way to the Father except through the Son. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He is Sar Shalom. And this is what he said. He said, peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. couple observations with that. The first is Jesus said he gives his peace. So that means it's not our definition of peace. The second thing I see is there's this insinuation that there's a thing called worldly peace because he said, I don't give peace as the world gives. And so you say the world can give peace. Well, kind of. Worldly peace is conditional peace. It's temporary peace. And ultimately, it's a false peace. And so that's why we err to define peace as the absence of conflict. Because while the prince of peace can give his peace, the prince of this world can provide peace as well. And, and his peace will pretty much leave you alone and let you go along your merry way as long as you're going in the same direction that he's going. Right? And so we said that there, it's conditional peace. You know what it means? It means we have to compromise in order to get it. 
And so Jesus told his disciples in advance, he said, look, tribulation and trials, they're going to come, but I have told you th these things so that in me, you may have peace. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. But he said, be of good cheer or take heart, or it could be translated even, don't lose your peace. Why? Because I have overcome the world. His is an everlasting peace. Unlike the widow who had rest and peace put on her husband's tombstone. Then she found out that he left her out of his will. And she added, till I come. <laughs> and so peace is a person. And the second thing I know about peace is we find peace on purpose. We find peace on purpose. No one finds the peace of Christ on accident. It's because we were intentional to walk into it. We all know what it's like to lose our peace. Come on, you got WBGL blaring in the car and you're praising Jesus and then the kids act up and you lose your religion. Come on, somebody. <laughs> we know what that's like. See, peace the world offers, it comes and it goes, but we can have lasting peace through a relationship with Jesus. Paul said in Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what it really gets down to, church, is it's a matter of lordship. If you are going to be the Lord of your life, then you're going to struggle to maintain peace. But if Jesus is the Lord, then you can have lasting peace. We've all likely seen the bumper sticker that says, no Jesus, no peace. In other words, to know Jesus is to know peace. But where there is no Jesus, there is no peace. That's just the way that it is. And what we have to understand is that knowing Jesus is a choice because it's not his will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance and into a relationship with him. It's a choice. But here's the thing. For those of us who do know him, keeping our peace is a choice too. That's why Paul said in Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. That means that we can not let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Well, how do you do that? By remaining under the lordship of the Prince of Peace. Accepting him as Lord is one thing, but submitting to that lordship day in and day out is another thing altogether. But this is what I know. We can't live outside the will of of God and maintain his peace at the same time. It doesn't work. And so if you're living in known sin and you feel like you have peace, you need to hear me, brother. You need to hear me, sister. That's a false peace. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit. But I want to tell you, peace is the greatest, the greatest daily benefit of knowing Jesus. Come on, it's not wealth or riches or power or anything else. It's the peace of God. So peace is a person and we find peace on purpose and because it's Christmas, I'll give you an additional Christmas gift and we'll just keep this whole P thing going. Peace is polarizing. In other words, people are drawn to peace. Why? Because the peace of the world is always temporary. It, it's here for a moment and then it's gone the next. It, it's, as, it's as fragile as a missed 43-yard field goal. And Bears fans throughout the room just lost their peace. <laughs> the reality is Christians face all of the same things that people in the world do. Isn't that right? We, we get sick at times. We struggle financially. We have relationship difficulties. But the difference is we can keep our peace even under tribulation. That's the difference. And people are drawn to that. They want to know how we can remain calm in the face of the storm. There was a time in this nation where people sought truth. In, in a postmodern society, that is no longer the case. People are not interested in what's true. They are interested in what works. And so what we do is we take the Bible and we figure we'll just keep quoting it, keep hitting them over the head with it, and eventually they'll get it. They won't until they see it first in us. And one of the main ways they do that is when we experience that peace that passes all understanding or literally passes all comprehension. They don't get it. 
Of course they don't. We don't get it. How many of you have been in such a peaceful state in such a difficult situation that it surprised you? Well, of course it surprises them as well. But they want it. They want it. They're drawn to it. Everybody wants peace. Alfred Nobel invented dynamite. And so in 1863, after years of working on it, he released dynamite. Now the idea of dynamite was it was going to be used as a way to break up the mountains and continue spreading the railways out west. But what happened was we took a good thing as men tend to do and we turned it into a destructive thing and it ended up being a weapon of war. And it was used in war and a lot of people died as a result. Now Alfred Nobel had the unique opportunity to read his own obituary. What happened was his brother died and a nationwide newspaper thought he had died and they wrote his obituary. And so here he is, he's reading his obituary and it says Alfred Nobel died a monster of humanity killed thousands of people. And right there, he realized his legacy was going to be something he never intended. And he decided he was going to do something about it. So he took $9 million of his own money, which would be equivalent to about $171 million today. And he established the Nobel Peace Prize to promote peace. Why? Because he was going to change his story. He was going to become a peacemaker. Can I tell you, God calls us to be peacemakers and extend his peace and his goodwill to those we encounter. And I'll tell you, Jesus paid a pretty high price for us to be able to have his peace. It's, it, it costs more than $9 million. It costs more than even $171 million. It costs Jesus his very life. Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He said the chastisement for our peace was upon him, but by his stripes we are healed. In other words, one of the reasons Jesus died was this, so we can have peace even in a chaotic, fallen world. As I wrap up this message and this series for that matter, uh, let me say this. In a few days, you're going to give gifts and likely you're going to receive gifts. And some of you are going to get exactly what you wanted because you asked for it and someone loved you and bought it for you or because you bought it yourself, but either way, you're going to get it. Others of you, you're going to get something that you love that you didn't even know you wanted because there's going to be someone thoughtful in your life who knows you better than you know yourself and they found it for you. And because of their thoughtfulness, you're going to get that gift. But some of you are going to get another ugly sweater, <laughs> which means likely some of you are going to give away the ugly sweater. But this is, this is what I know and this is what I want to leave you with. Whether you like or dislike what you get for Christmas, one day it's going to end up in a garage sale, a garbage dump, or a recycle bin. That's just the way that it is. But the peace of God passes all understanding and it is an everlasting peace. And our prayer for you as you leave this place is that you maintain shalom in your home. From our family to yours, we wish you a very Merry Christmas.